Uh, welcome everybody. My name is Awasar and I'm Assistant Director for Academic Affairs at the African Studies Center. And this is Eye on Africa, our weekly seminary series. So we're very, very happy today to have uh, Dr. Emily Leslie Hartfield, uh, Dr. Kokel Melubo, and Dr. Festo Makenda as our guest speakers from the US, Tanzania, and I think Italy. So we're all over the world today and we're very excited. But before I pass it on to our guests, a brief introduction. So I will start with Dr. Leslie Hartfield, who received a PhD in African history from Michigan State University. So welcome back, virtually. We're very happy to have you here. Uh, Dr. Hartfield has been teaching African history at Brigham Young University since 2010 and is now also the coordinator for BYU's African Studies program. Dr. Hatfield primarily studies South African contemporary social and political history. Her research interests include South African liberation movements and the work and lives of Black nurses in the Eastern Cape. Oral history has played an important role in her work. She has conducted extensive interviews in South Africa in both English and the Hausa language, which she speaks. These interviews formed the basis for her first books, Liberation and Development, Black Consciousness Community Programs in South Africa, MSU Press 2016, and A Bold Profession, African Nurses in Rural Apartheid South Africa, University of Wisconsin Press 2021. Dr. Hartfield also speaks Kiswali and has accompanied several groups of students on Mount Kilimanjaro climbing experiences. So thank you so much for being here. Uh, now I will introduce Dr. Kokel uh, Melobo. Uh, he holds degrees in natural resource management and, nat and nature-based tourism. He is senior lecturer at the College of African Wildlife Management in Makawa, located in Kilimanjaro, Tanzania. His environmental tourism interests include wildlife tourism, ecotourism, and community development. His publications include a book titled Ecotourism and Livelihoods Among the Maasai in Ngorongoro, uh, Tanzania, from Lambert Academic Publishing 2013 and an article and these following articles. The working conditions for Wagumu on Mount Kilimanjaro and an exploration of tourism related labor conditions, the case of tour guides in Tanzania. And that was in 2016. Thank you also, uh, Dr. Melibo for being here. Our last but not least guest speaker today is Dr. Festo Makenda who is a historian with general interest in matters of identity and nationalism, and also in the history of Christianity in Africa. His research on the people around Mount Kilimanjaro culminated in a default thesis entitled, Building National Unity in Sub-Saharan Africa, the impact of state policies on the Chaga community in Northern Tanzania from University of Oxford 29. His most recent publications include The Jesuits in Africa, a historical narrative from Ignatius of Loyola to Pedro Arupe, and A Splash of Diamonds, the Jesuit presence in Ethiopia from 1945 to the present, and that's 2023. Uh, Dr. Makenda currently serves as academic director of the Roman Archives of the Society of Jesus and part-time lectures at the Pontifical Gregorian University in Rome. And the title of the talk today is Uncovering the History of Kilimanjaro Mountain Cruise. Thank you so much uh, for being here. And I pass it now to Dr. Leslie to, to proceed. Over to you. Thank you so much. I'm gonna just share my screen and share our slides here. I hope everybody can see them. Uh, we, I'm really excited to be here today to be part of MSU's African Study Center Speaker Series, especially as an alumna. So thank you for inviting us. This is a great opportunity for us. Um, by way of introduction, I'm going to talk about uh, how our project came about, how we came together, 
and uh, what our main objectives are. You know, I'm thinking about how we like to fixate on firsts, people who are the first to achieve a great feat or first to pave the way in a certain uh, sector. And especially with Black History Month, I've been thinking about that as we highlight these people who are the first. Um, and this is especially a characteristic of mountaineering history. In the history of Mount Kilimanjaro, most written accounts of those who have climbed Kilimanjaro have focused on the achievements of Europeans. And this is uh, due to the mountaineering world being mostly European at the time, and also because mountaineering was part of European colonialism. And so I'm gonna show this uh, colonial map of Africa at this time about 1902 with an arrow to Mount Kilimanjaro there in the German East African colony at the time, now Tanzania, Northern Tanzania. Um, European mountaineers in the late 19th and 20th century sought to claim and conquer this land for Imperial Europe. And often as they did this, they erased the humanity of the local people that made those achievements possible as they enacted this romantic, lonely white man in the wilds of Africa trope. So this historical narrative of Kilimanjaro mountain climbing uh, history peaks with the first recorded su successful ascent of the mountain by Hans Mayer in 1889. Uh, and we'll talk a little bit more about these people here, but here you can see them highlighted at the main gate, the Kilimanjaro National Park or Kanapa Gate at Marangu. Even today, I think many published accounts of Kilimanjaro climbers remain largely stories about foreigners who make it to the top. But what of the thousands of local guides and porters who spent their lives securing safe journeys to the top from the late 19th century on. You can see a picture here of Hans Mayer's caravan in 1889 and some of the, the porters there. So this question is really one of the main questions driving our project. To whom do endless numbers of foreign tourists owe their successful ascents? The majority of the individuals who have long supported climbers on Mount Kilimanjaro with such strength and skill really go unnamed and unrecognized. And even today, there are thousands who work on the mountain. Um, this next picture, I apologize for the poor quality, but it was the best I could do at the time. This is a picture in the Morongo Hotel, which is one of the first hotels to outfit uh, tourists coming to climb the, the mountain. And you can see the, the Chaga porters and guides there with the European uh, climbers. And um, again, many of these people go unnamed and unrecognized. So what role did they play in shaping the mountain uh, tourism industry that really steadily developed on Kilimanjaro since the 1930s? That's a, a main question. And our, our book really seeks to bring to light this history of individuals who've worked since that time, since the late 19th century to the present day, in order to acknowledge the work of those who performed the hardest and most valuable tasks on the mountain, and to examine important dynamics of the climbing tourism industry uh, um, to today. We argue that the Kilimanjaro climbing industry developed in a colonial context and that these characteristics have persisted to today, even with changes in the post-independence period and in such other realities as economics, clientele, technology, environmental regulations, and the gender of porters and guides um, and their ethnicity. But even as the industry has been westernized and globalized, we also see how local Tanzanian actors have played an important role in shaping the industry, though to different degrees uh, at different times. And really one of our main approaches or what we seek to do in presenting this history is, and the current issues in the industry is um, doing this from the mountain looking out rather than from outside of Tanzania or Africa looking in. And so we asked ourselves and we discussed um, in one of these meetings, our first meetings we had in person, what would this history look like from a local Chaga or Tanzanian perspective? So the book, um, the structure of the book that we're working on uh, begins by, it begins by exploring the relationship of local Chaga groups with the mountain. And uh, that's where Dr. Mkenda's 
expertise really comes in. Then it turns to the roles and experiences of local guides and porters through the rise of the Kilimanjaro climbing tourism in the early part of the 20th century. And as it moves forward chronologically, we highlight changes after Tanzania's independence in 1961. And the book's narrative culminates at the turn of the 21st century when more Tanzanians engaged in the work of porters and guides and there was greater awareness um, about the, their working conditions and remunerations. Um, and that's where a lot of Dr. Malubo's work comes in. So the book um, at the end joins local actors on the mountain in their call for more equitable practices in the Kilimanjaro climbing tourism industry. Now, as you can hear, as I've talked about this, um, the book really is a multidisciplinary work by the three of us. We've got two historians and one tourism expert um, who uncovers the current story of mountain crews. And this is an important part of our project. Um, Dr. Malubo has been one of the few who have written about the condition of porters on Kilimanjaro. And my colleague, Jeff Durant, who used to be in the geography department at BYU, um, he started this study abroad program where they took students to climb Kilimanjaro and then spend some time at the College of African Wildlife Management at Moika. And he was looking to do some further research on porters and invited me to participate because I could speak Swahili, I'd been to Tanzania before. And so when I was on a trip to Tanzania in 2017, my colleagues sent me to talk to Dr. Malubo. So I just showed up unannounced at the college and knocked on Malubo's door. Uh, he was very kind and graciously spoke with me at that time. Uh, the project morphed into something else. It ended up in an edited volume on protected areas in Northern Tanzania uh, that where we had Moika professors and BYU professors both contributing. And as I was working on my contribution to this edited volume, I found there were some rich sources available to uncover this history of mountain crews that was generally unknown. And it was pretty clear to me once I got into this that a full length book was warranted. But I also knew that I didn't have the skills or expertise to do this alone. So Malubo agreed to work with me, even though he has a lot of other great research interests. And we asked around, um, Alex Casingo, who was a, a lecturer there at Moika, he pointed us to Father Mkenda, who we were very excited to have uh, agree to work with us. Um, so the rest of this, uh, and, and you can see here, we first, we corresponded uh, via email, and then we first were able to meet in 2021 in Moika. And I thought I would include that picture of us with our masks on just to mark that time period. And then the following year, we all uh, met in Utah as well as they both came um, to speak at BYU. So there's some pictures there. It's been great to work with um, these two scholars. So the rest of the, the presentation is going to go as follows. Dr. Kenda will talk about our research uh, approach generally. And then we will each take some time to comment on what we see as our outstanding findings. And then Dr. Malubo will cover some recommendations for a current day, and we will conclude with some thoughts about the collaboration process. So I am going to now turn the time over to Dr. Mkenda. And you can just tell me when you're ready for the slides to be advanced. Thank you very much, Leslie, and I thank you everybody for, for being here. This is really a pleasure for me to, uh, to participate in this and make this presentation. And so I'm um, just continuing from where Leslie has left uh, uh, briefly uh, to talk about our research and research experience. Um, so the history of the mountain is really what we are trying to do, looking at this over the centuries and paying attention to the people who have related to that mountain. And as Leslie also emphasized, we recognize that that history has been told, but of course mainly focusing on tourist mountaineering and uh, with uh, some attention to local facilitation especially to porters, cooks, and guides, but most often told from the perspective of the climbers who are mainly foreigners. So we 
we clearly identified a gap that we hope uh, our book will be able uh, um, to fill. Uh, I would say we did uh, two things, main, two main things. The first one, as a way of research, we thought to understand what is already known. And so Kilimanjaro has a lot of literature already covering mountaineering, but also covering the people who live around Mount Kilimanjaro. Uh, many scholars recognize that the Chaga are among the best studied people uh, in Tanzania. And so we tap into that uh, richness as well. And uh, uh, that gives us a lot of knowledge. We seek to understand what people already know or what they think uh, uh, they know. If Leslie, you could project the next slide. I just want to point your attention to what I generally consider people popularly know, for example, this is the time frame of the history of Kilimanjaro as it can be found at a, in Moshi town at the main center of the Kilimanjaro Native Cooperative Union, starting the story with 1848 when and the missionary Redman saw the snow of Mount Kilimanjaro uh, first time by a Euro European and was able to report that to Europe. And then you can see the people run down that history all the way to 1889, when Hans Meyer uh, goes up the mountain, up to the summit. So this is the popular narrative that is known. Uh, I would go back to 188, I would come back later to 1886, as you can see there saying, Queen Victoria gives the mountain to her nephew, Kaiser William II, uh, uh, or, or as a birthday gift. I'll come back to that detail, but this roughly gives you an idea of the kind of knowledge that people have. And this keeps on recite what now and then and then in popular narratives in Kilimanjaro and in Tanzania in general. So from what is known from the literature that is available, we sought to find new information, new knowledge. And this then happened in two kinds of research. The first one is a, a serious archival research in different archives. The early part of this book benefits a lot from my own work, my own earlier work on the history of the Chaga and the history of Mount Kilimanjaro, most of which I did in, 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 in the Tanzanian National Archives based in Dar es Salaam in Tanzania and also in the library of the University of Dar es Salaam, where there's a lot of literature on Kilimanjaro. And finally, in the archives of the Lutheran Church in Moshi, in Kilimanjaro. Uh, so the, the, the early part of this book that covers the history of the people and the history of the mountain benefits from that early research and from those archives. The latter part of the project also benefits from the from sources in the Lutheran archive in Moshi, which I have also which I've already mentioned. However, the most important archive for this uh, latter part is the archives of the uh, Kilimanjaro Mountain Club that are found uh, at a hotel in Mochi, uh, which which houses the documents of uh, of this association of the Mountain Club all the way back to the 1930s. This collection was particularly important for the period between 1930s and the 1960s. In this archive, we found uh, scrapbooks, meeting minutes, and correspondence with hotels and government officials. These revealed uh, the interworkings of the nascent mountain tourism industry. Relationships between the club, guides, porters, hotel, Chaga political leaders, government, and, and, and the tourists, the clients of this industry, in this industry are uh, also manifest in those records. They also included newspapers, uh, newspaper accounts that shed light on any trips uh, onto Mount Kilimanjaro. The records in this archive provided clues about the work characteristics and the relationships between the mountain workers and the visiting climate. 
Unfortunately, as it often happens with records of this nature, they rarely contain first-hand words or perspectives of the early guides, cooks, and porters. This was a challenge to our research, which had to be faced by, create, by first creatively by using descriptions of those early guides, cooks, and porters in order to figure out their roles and their characters. This approach was supplemented by other sources, especially through oral history. And this uh, brings me to the second kind of research that we did, that is uh, through oral history research. We saw, through this, we sought to gain knowledge from what concerned the people remembered from the past, as well as from what they knew from their own lived experiences. And this is very important for us. This entailed hours of listening carefully to other people's life stories and raising relevant follow-up uh, follow questions from what we had heard. We had heard. Uh, for this part of the research, we benefited from the help of of four research assistants. Once we had identified them, we gave, uh, we, we, we gave them a training. We trained them to conduct oral history interviews professionally. We also provided them with digital recorders and other materials they needed to collect and securely preserve the information they gathered in, in easily retrievable ways. And finally, the same research assistants also transcribed the recordings, making the work very easy for us. And so uh, uh, archival research and oral research gave us a lot of information that we are working with. Uh, uh, the research assistants helped us a lot in collecting the information, mainly in three languages, in Swahili principally, but also occasional English and Chaga. It is entirely our role uh, to interpret that information, and it's a work that we are doing currently uh, very diligently. I think I will stop there and uh, we move on to uh, the main findings. Malubo, I mean, Mutanda, did you want to explain some of the other slides we had? Um, um, yes, please. Let's, let's, okay. let's go slightly back to the second slide. Uh, sorry, I didn't explain this. So um, in Kilimanjaro, walking around the mountain, uh, you discover a lot of history. And really part of my own research into the history of the Chaga people uh, it involved just going around the mountain, identifying all the sites and what you might find written on them. Uh, so, for example, this image shows uh, 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 this uh, uh, writings in Germany of the early baptisms conducted in the area called Old Dimoshi. If you can go to the next slide, uh, Leslie. And this, this details here, for example, they say this is the place where baptisms happened between this time, 1889 and 1892. Uh, this gives us a clue of what was happening and where to find, for example, who were the early people baptized uh, and, and, uh, and, and details uh, like that about the Chaga people and Kilimanjaro. If we move to the next slide, uh, Leslie, these are some of the documents uh, that we found in the archives of the Kilimanjaro Mountain Club in Marangu in Moshi. Uh, very important documents that also, uh, as I said, uh, give clues to the early relationships between climbers and those who help them to, or, uh, to climb uh, onto Kilimanjaro. Okay, you, yes, go ahead, Festo, to the next part. Okay, um, I go ahead to outstanding. Findings. That's right. Okay. Thanks. Um, so I will I will say a few things and and then I will leave it to Leslie and Melubo to continue on what they found to be outstanding. Uh, the first thing for me is the 
Chaga identity. Uh, so the group that we call Chaga today, uh, uh, a well-knit uh, cultural group uh, is interesting in many ways. Uh, they trace their origins to multiple ancestry. Uh, these are people who came from different parts of Eastern Africa, the broader region of Eastern Africa, climbed the mountain, came up with a culture and an economy, and therefore uh, and, uh, carved an identity for themselves called the Chaga. Their language is made up of multiple dialects that are sometimes uh, are so different that some, some scholars would argue that probably they don't even constitute a single language. Uh, and yet, uh, historically, the Chaga have been one of the most easily recognizable people in Tanzania, probably one of the reasons many people have gone to study them. Uh, um, they are very closely linked in the past. They hardly migrated beyond Mount Kilimanjaro. Um, but today they are the most migrating community in the country. But even when they go farther from the mountain, they are very easily recognized as the Chaga people. So an interesting group to study in terms of what it means, for example, to be an ethnic identity in Eastern Africa and in other parts of the world, really, that people come from all multiple places and, and, and build up an identity. And the story of the Chaga people really uh, tell that story very significantly. The second thing uh, that is outstanding for me is their relationship, the relationship of that very identity as Chaga with, uh, with Mount Kilimanjaro. Uh, one famous chief in Kilimanjaro called Chief Thomas Mariane once said that when he went away from Kilimanjaro, the thing that he missed the most was just the sight of the mountain. And, and I think there's a lot of truth to that. Uh, it's clear that the climate of the mountain, the richness of its soils, is what attracted so many people from different parts uh, of Eastern Africa to go up the mountain and live there. And in turn, that also dictated, for example, what kinds of food they eat. The Chaga eat bananas. If you never ate bananas, you were not a Chaga. And so things like that, the mountain really determined their identity and so many other cultural details. Uh, for example, the Chaga would always pray facing the mountain. They would always bury their dead facing the mountain. They would even slaughter their dogs facing the mountain. So the mountain really is a very important aspect of that identity, the identity that we call the Chaga today. And I find that uh, quite outstanding. And uh, the third thing, and we will end with that is a uh, rather huge discrepancy between what we can find from research and what we can say that, yes, this is what uh, the Chaga identity is, and uh, other popular narratives going around, especially in Tanzania today, that are in themselves very problematic, sometimes informed by current politics in Tanzania. So, for example, um, um, for example, how long have the Chaga lived on Mount Kilimanjaro? That is really a very controversial question. And I, I have people who have written books arguing that they have been there for at least over seven centuries, and I can hardly uh, provide, find any evidence for that. In fact, I think the Chaga are very recent. Uh, uh, very recent comers, uh, inhabitants of Mount Kilimanjaro, uh, the most I would give them is probably four to five centuries. And so there's that discrepancy. Another, another interesting discrepancy is what I, was, I said, I would come back to. Uh, the, 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 the idea that the mountain, for example, was given by Queen Victoria to, to, to her nephew, Kaiser William II of Germany, there's hardly any, any historical record uh, uh, proving that. And that is even more complicated by the fact that uh, the first place the Germans occupied when they moved to what is Tanzania today, or what was then a German East Africa, was Moti. And they ran the territory first from Moti, actually. That was their first headquarters. And I find no evidence whatsoever 
that after German occupation, that border has changed in one way or another. And so that's a problematic detail, something that is in the popular understanding of the history that is contradicted by what we can find in historical sources. Um, I will leave it there, and uh, I think, Leslie, you continue from there. Yes, I will continue from here. Thank you. Um, for me, the most exciting information that I've learned, we've learned, is about the first men who worked in the industry. And they really set the tone for decades to come, from pay and work expectations to support through culture, and of course, ensuring the success and even survival of climbers. Um, so I want to go through a few of these uh, slides. I have there, there are four men who are pretty prominent in the historical record who I will give information about, but because of time, I'll kind of go through quickly. But I'll talk about how these guides developed unparalleled expertise on the mountain, or guiding foreigners and running operations. Cooks and porters were also valuable members of the industry, and they asserted themselves in negotiating pay and other work conditions during the first few decades of the industry. So it was exciting to see how the written record and the oral history also came together to illuminate these individuals. Um, <clears throat> this slide will start off with uh, Lauwo. He's gained the most attention over others because the Tanzanian committee in charge of the centenary celebrations of the first successful ascent of Europeans to the top determined that Lauwo, still living in Morongo in 1989, had accompanied Hans Mayer and Ludwig Kutschel in 1889. Now, archival records and oral history are giving us different information. You can see these different years of his birth on the slide with question marks. Uh, we're not going to give conclusive answers here, but this led to um, some important and productive questions that were raised. And what I've come to uh, believe is that even if a local man had not been there with Mayor and Pushteller in 1889, Tanzania can still celebrate Lowell and his fellow guides, who I'll highlight in these uh, coming slides, for their achievements. And perhaps even greater than being the first or accompanying the Mayor and Pushteller, they spent the longest time on the mountain gained the most intimate knowledge of it and supported the most people in reaching it at the top. And so in that sense, they all, not just one, should be celebrated as the longtime heroes of the mountain along with the others of the support crews. Um, oral history es uh, emphasized the challenging conditions that these guides worked under without proper equipment, clothes, shoes, or itineraries and language skills. Still, they advised on weather conditions, they knew altitude um, levels, they set the pace for hiking in high altitudes and ensured that climbers had adequate food. They even at the beginning acted as cooks until that became a specialized job. They were very attentive uh, to their clients. Um, and you can see here another uh, very important person in, the, in this industry, Mwambari Moshe, or Toma, as he was also known. Um, he hunted in the forest with Lauo. Uh, through oral history, we gained that, and that's why they started working as guides. Worked about the same time, the same years as Lauo. And he was often uh, highlighted as having great leadership um, and being gentle and quietly efficient. In January 1941, um, one visitor wrote, I could not speak the language, and yet he understood what I wanted almost by instinct. And similarly, a group wrote of Lauo, very cheery and helpful and fully understands one's needs. Um, I'm going to come to this next slide about Sambonanga, who was another prominent individual in this early industry in the records. And I think a 1946 entry of a visitor sums up the critical encouragement guides provided. Quote, only the cheerful disposition of our guide Sambonanga kept us going at times when mountain sickness brought us to our knees. And there were a lot of descriptions of um, the way that, the ways that these guides worked with um, these visitors. And I could go on and on, but I won't. I want to talk a little bit more about the porters. The guides also managed um, the teams, including the cooks and porters. And the porters were brought into the formalization of the industry on the mountain early on um, through the mountain club. And these mountain club records detail the names and ages of the porters in the within the first decade. And here's 
Another slide about Jonathan Mtui, who is a prominent guide, and you can see there that many of his sons and grandsons worked on the mountain. We interviewed uh, those grandsons who are listed there. There are others. Um, so many of them have, um, if, if we also look at this um, list, very early list from the Mountain Club of uh, Toma Mlambari and his crew there, his crew of porters, um, that all of them are men or were men, mostly uh, from the same regions um, and uh, same uh, villages and very similar age, around age 30. So population pressure on the land may have led these young men to look for more economic opportunities in addition to what they were already doing. And oral history interviews really indicated that many went to work because um, things were not work other things were not working for them. It was, it was hard work. Um, and here's a, a quote from a letter uh, in the Kilimanjaro Mountain Club talking about what the, the weight that the porters carried and the food that they would eat. So this was hard work and they didn't go there just for fun. They went, they went because um, they, they felt they needed to. If somebody said it was, it was a problem or struggling that took you there. Um, and because of this, they also were very interested in the pay, of course. Um, and so this was an important part of, of their role. Um, at times, porters used their collective power to obtain pay increases, especially around World War II. There were prominent strikes in 1946 and 1954. And here is a letter from one of the hotel owners. So the Kibo Hotel and Morongo Hotel were the two main hotels. And Rolf writing in 1949. And those parts that I've marked with the, the red there um, she was reminding them, the Mountain Club, that she had said in 19, uh, you know, two years earlier in 1947, that you've got to settle this matter because she didn't want to have to continue to have these unpleasant discussions in front of visitors, in front of the clients with the, with the porters. And um, she said there, they're always asking for higher pay and they wouldn't do the job if they were not uh, sure to get a good backsheesh or tip from the climbers on top of their pay. Um, records and oral history also gave us insights into changes that, um, well, into the, the ways that these porters worked with each other. Um, there was one, uh, for example, in 1941, visitors talking about how uh, grateful they were for San Bonanga's uh, service, as well as the, quote, choir of Christian porters who furnished us with music in four parts every evening as they relaxed with each other. Um, the records and oral history, as uh, Dr. Mkenda said, also give us insight into changes that came with independence and the establishment of the Kilimanjaro uh, National Park around the turn of the, and then things that came around the turn of the most recent century. And I'm going to now give the time over to Dr. Malubo to talk about the findings that he found most outstanding in his work. Beautiful. Uh, thank you, everyone, for coming. Thank you, Leslie and Dr. Mkenda, for that beautiful introduction. Uh, my part was more about tourism and uh, in connection with the porters or the mountain crew. And in so doing, I first suggest that it was important to appreciate the status of Mount Kilimanjaro. What is Kilimanjaro to us right now. Uh, we do remember that in 1961, uh, Mwalimu Nyerere suggested, who happened to be the president of the country, uh, first president, suggested that we uh, lead a torch on Mount Kilimanjaro to represent freedom and hope for Tanzania and guest colonialism. So that calls that the mountain now or is part of Tanzania and we are an independent country. And from it, we are celebrating our, our freedom. But also uh, the country or the government has made some changes uh, in indigenizing Mount Kilimanjaro. Some European names that, for example, happen to be called Bismarck Point, uh, Peters Point and Kaiser well Wilma, uh, have now been more localized or more indigenized. We now call them, we appreciate them by Mandara Hat, Uhuru Hat, Uhuru Peak, and Horombo Hat. 
And uh, another important uh, point to acknowledge is that uh, the Tourism Act uh, of Tanzania 20, 2008 requires the trekking business of Mount Kilimanjaro to be operated by Tanzanian citizens. Of course, there's a challenge with regard to that because uh, uh, the companies, quite much of them are seen uh, operated by foreign. So a big share of the, the trekking business is under the hands of foreigners. Uh, but the wish of the act and of the government is to see this business be managed and run by Tanzanians. Um, Kilimanjaro is also known to be one of the pro poor uh, tourism dest uh, destination in Tanzania, employing 15,000 locals, uh, serving as guides, cooks, and porters. Uh, almost 100% of all of them happen to be Tanzanians coming from the region of Kilimanjaro and Arusha, of course, uh, as far as Tanga and Manyara, and sometimes of Tanzania as well. Um, it's, 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 so it's important to acknowledge that it's the most engaging tourism destination in Tanzania, unlike Serengeti, for example, or Tarangire, which uh, you have one driver carrying several tourists in, um, who happen to be, of course, uh, foreigners, quite a good number. But with Kilimanjaro, you have uh, one guy, one tourist be guided by a, a guide, an assistant guide, a cook, and a porter. So you have three people supporting one tourist, and all of them will be uh, will be required to uh, will will for sure require I uh, expect some payment. Uh, Kilimanjaro is also the second most paying tourism destination in Tanzania after Serengeti. Uh, it actually tops up the rest of other national parks. Tanzania happened to have 21 national parks so far, and uh, Kilimanjaro is a top a uh, second top after Serengeti. And it's because one will be required to, to climb Kilimanjaro, one will be required to stay uh, for six nights at least. And so you have to pay all the nights. Uh, whether you manage to go in a single day and return, that they don't, that doesn't matter much. Uh, anyone who registers to climb Kilimanjaro has to pay at least for six nights. And that is a good a good case for the government, for the porters, and the entire mountain crew. Uh, let's talk about the working condition, which has been an area that I've been trying to work on for quite some time now. Um, it, it's important to acknowledge that uh, majority of porters are men. Of course, there's a, a small number of female uh, guides who are joining up the industry, but still pretty challenging to them. And these guys are at the range of 18 to 40 years. Most of them are less educated and they come from the Chaga community in Kilimanjaro. Uh, with regard to the challenges that these people happen to uh, be experiencing, of course, there are critical challenges. And one of it is uh, the luggage they carry. Uh, a surprise study was done sometimes back and they actually found that one could carry uh, about 30 to 40 kgs. I, I don't know how you could put it in the American, but at least uh, that's quite much. The requirement is one has to have 20 kg, uh, 20 kg, the recommendation is 20, uh, 15 kgs, uh, 25 kgs, I don't know, I'm, I'm missing that a little bit. But 20 for the guy, for the tourist, five kgs for his own personal belongings. But uh, as I say, the uh, surprises, uh, surprise uh, weigh, weighing of, or scaling of these luggage tend always to be quite, shows that they carry much than expected or required. Uh, and this is, has implication with, with, with their heads. Porters often lack sufficient clothing, footwear, the sleeping bags, and backpackers. Um, and this, of course, has problem because uh, 
you know, we are in a tropic, quite sunny environment. One going up to a very extreme cold environment will for sure be required to have some fishing dressing or sufficient clothing. And unfortunately, that's not the case to all porters. I understand, I'll mention later on that there are some efforts uh, to address some of these concerns. And of course, they seem to be quite happy of the efforts, but uh, yet a long way to be uh, walked. Uh, and with that regard, about 12 to 12 to beyond number, uh, to uh, above up to 12 or much more than that, uh, porters die annually uh, resulting from the difficult conditions they face on Mount Kilimanjaro. The underpayment is also another critical concern. There's a suggestion by Kilimanjaro National Park Authority that uh, one has to receive. Uh, for a porter, a suggestion was about $10 per day, $20 for a guide, and $15 per a cook. But it doesn't go quite well with all the companies. Sometimes you get, and especially the locally owned operators uh, seem to be accused of failing that. Uh, it's, uh, some pay up to 10000 which is equivalent to $5 per day. And that's quite a peanut. So tipping uh, has, has actually constituted the proportion of the most underpaid uh, 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 a crew wage of the Mount Kilimanjaro. The majority of trekking companies do not provide meals to mountain crew. It is understood that on average, an average uh, that on average a porter receive a light meal, uh, quite a light, uh, light meal a day, and uh, they have actually come with a way to go about that. They have created the, what they may consider to be ma ma macomeo which is eat once for the whole, for the day. So you could actually go for groundnuts, bread, and chapati to fuel uh, yourself with a very uh, tough rate, terrain on Mount Kilimanjaro. Porters have less space in Kilimanjaro huts. Uh, the, the accommodation facilities that are found on Mount Kilimanjaro tend to provide, so it, the guide has the say, uh, he's the boss of the porters, so he's likely to get the best service or the better service compared to two guys. So if there's anything to come first, it is the guide and then the porters will. But in most cases, the porters have been disadvantaged on that. Uh, they use canvas or they sometimes sleep on canvas or tins or plastics, and that has been uh, highlighted also by the, the Kilwa. I personally have witnessed that. So, because I've taken guides up, porters up to Mount Kilimanjaro several times. Uh, so, I can truly say, indeed, that's what is happening. But yes, uh, highlighting the interventions, uh, there's a quite a very strong uh, uh, intervention uh, coming from the Porters Association and some NGOs that are working on Kilimanjaro and Mount Meru. They sometimes come together when it comes to matters addressing the critical challenges facing uh, porters. So there's some training going on. Uh, they have done that in the past, and uh, training related to language, environmental responsibility, labor procedures, and related. Uh, and about also uh, the caring, how much one has to carry, and you know, building up the confidence so that you don't have really to be too submissive to carry too much that may be dangerous for yourself in the future. And they have also been working on provision of clothing, uh, waterproof and uh, windproof uh, rain gears or uh, dresses to help them uh, be fit as they help visitors up to Mount Kilimanjaro. Provision of medical treatment in the event of injury has been a success quite of much, and provision of sleeping arrangements, and at least some companies have uh, worked quite well on this. And uh, see 
So that is uh, a much of uh, the challenges and the intervention uh, facing the very important people who support uh, trekkers to Mount Kilimanjaro. Speaking about recommendation, Leslie, is that right that I go into recommendation? Yes, that's correct. Yeah, go ahead. All right. Okay. Recommendation. Uh, we suggest, and our book, uh, our, our project suggests that with regard to improving the working condition of porters, that the associations, Kilimanjaro Porters Association, Tanzania, Tanzania Porters Association, need to merge for a powerful force that voices the mistreatment and abnormalities of porters. Uh, we have quite a good number of associations and we believe them being disunited is a problem because they can always be uh, challenged when it comes to uh, the challenges that they face. So it is important that they come as a united force for them to speak against the uh, all the challenges that the porters are facing. There's less about guides because guides in this particular case seem to be quite powerful compared to porters. But there's also a government intervention coming from, for example, the Tanzania Tourism Police. Um, we now have a Tanzania Diplomatic Police Unit that uh, deals with all the challenges that the tourism industry faces, and this includes the porters. So if a porter happened not to be well paid or his uh, wage hasn't been taken care of, he has got at least an office, a government office, to report his matters. And uh, I believe this has been quite uh, a very strong intervention and porters are pretty happy. At least I've managed to meet the TPO guys and they speak beautiful about uh, the support from uh, diplomatic police. Tanzania. Kinapa, the Kilimanjaro National Park Authority, uh, of course, these uh, are the guys, they're the gatekeepers of uh, anybody going up to Mount Kilimanjaro. So they have got a very strong uh, uh, power, you could possibly say, you know, to help address this concern that the porters are facing. They could do weighing up, you know, weighing the luggage before one takes up and do surprise checks, and work on the recommendation with regard to payments. Uh, they're the guys I, would be, I strongly believe that they can for sure, their intervention will for sure help quite much. Promotion of ethical and proper treatment of mountain porter. Um, this is also, we, we have NGOs, for example, called Kilimanjaro Porter's Assistant Project. This has been quite an advocate of ethical tourism on Mount Kilimanjaro. It encourages two operators to be, you know, to treat the porters fairly better as human, but also as a responsible individual who are the soul and the heart of Mount Kilimanjaro. So some companies have joined KPAP uh, being members or partners, and in that way, they have actually made a commitment that they will be uh, promoting and try to be quite responsible with regard to conditions and uh, welfare of quarters of Mount Kilimanjaro. Uh, training, training, training. We at uh, the college that I work for, Mweka Wildlife College, we have undertaken uh, trainings to porters and uh, guides as well. We, we train porters to become guides. But uh, we train porters also just to be them and work for themselves and be excellent customers, uh, excellent uh, service providers to 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 trackers and uh, anyone who comes to them. So we, we we offer trainings to do with life skills, business skills on how best they can uh, use the little money they get from the mountain. Uh, interpretation skills, how to communicate and speak about the mountain, the ecology of the mountain, uh, regulation, adherence to laws and uh, regulation of Mount Kilimanjaro, conservation. There the, the, the was, there have been a concern on littering on Mount Kilimanjaro, but with porters being accused, of course, 
uh, that there are also a cause to this and uh, has also happened on Mount Manjaro. These guys have been also accused. So we, we, we kind of guide them to understand how important it is to keep uh, the mountain clean and all that are within the mountain. So, so far, Mweka has offered training to about 1,000 porters. These are some of the interventions and recommendations that we have managed to highlight in our beautiful project. If I may end up there, thank you. Yes, thank you, Malubo. So it looks like we have about five minutes uh, Correct. before our time is up, which is I think exactly what we were hoping for, uh, which is great. Um, so we wanted to share a few thoughts about the collaboration process. And I think I'll stop sharing my screen now. We don't have any more slides to really share, but just some thoughts to throw out there and then we can see what comes out in the, the questions. Um, but this is something that I thought would be important for us to address because of uh, the way that people have been talking about in African studies and in the US, um, how do we uh, collaborate equitably and have um, African knowledge and, and scholarship and and not just by African scholars, but also the communities, right? How, how do we forefront that? And so I'll just throw out a few ideas, a couple of things, then I would love to hear from my colleagues and then we will again open it up. Um, I just had uh, two thoughts, I think. Um, one is that Collaboration is best if it is done from the conceptualization stages. I, I hope that my colleagues feel that they had a say all along. I mean, I remember that meeting when we were at the first meeting in person in, in Malubo's office, where we were saying, okay, how, how are we going to do this going forward? And we decided to write what we had and then share and then put it together, which Dr. Mkenda is busy doing now. Um, so, but that is, if it's true collaboration, it should be. Um, from the, the conceptualization stages. Um, I, I have gained much from incorporating uh, each one of their expertise. And I think we the other point I wanna make is to that you can play to your strengths, right? What, what resources can each give? What knowledge and research could each contribute? So from Dr. Malubo, he has this great knowledge of the industry, which allowed us to pick what were some of these important things that we needed to highlight um, his that comes from his surveys. He had connections. He helped us hire all those research assistants, um, other connections in the area. Um, so helping introduce me to people at Kanapa the Gate so that I could go and ask questions about research questions we had. Um, for Dr. Mkenda, of course, the historical, cultural, and political knowledge, the knowledge of the local archives were so crucial. Um, and also the publication and writing guidance. Uh, and it's also exciting for me as a historian to have another historian go through all of the oral histories as well and um, analyze that together because usually historians, we, we have to work alone. And so it's really um, exciting for me. And I, I both really um, enjoyed hearing them teach my students as well. So I would love to hear if, if either one of you have any more thoughts on that. I think mine is uh, I've become more historian now. I <laughs> I had less understanding on how historians do their things, um, but teaming up with two great historians has made me more like yes, uh, can actually join them. Uh, so at least it is a great plus for me, and I truly agree with you that this study, the, the, the entire project has actually had all of us starting together. So we have been working along. None of us have just joined along the way. And I think we that brings a lot of a sense of ownership. We are part and parcel of the entire uh, project. So each one can truly acknowledge how great it was uh, to journey together. And the hurdles of becoming historians, of course, to me as well. So much transcription and uh, transcription of scripts, uh, details, thick documents, and, and so. Thank you. Thank you. I think I would I would want to point out two things that I think uh, um, really have come out very nicely in the experience of 
collaborating in this project. And the first one uh, is um, at least the attempt to look at the entire history as much as that is possible from the earliest period that we can do that to the present. I think that gives us a very fair analysis of the experience. And in all honest, I, uh, I, we wouldn't be able to do it if we didn't collaborate. Uh, I think my kind of expertise on the early history could never have arrived at some of the conclusions that uh, Melubo's research, for example, brought out because of his experience with the current reality. Uh, so I think that has been a great fruit of our collaboration and something that I would highly recommend for similar kinds of researches. Um, uh, the second thing is uh, that, uh, again, because of the oral history research, because of the actual relationship that some of us have with porters, guides, and cooks and all that, it has helped us to read that history also from the perspective of those people that are, are only named sometimes in, in historical records in the archives and elsewhere, even in more recent narratives of mountain climbing around Kilimanjaro, they are, they are named and appreciated sometimes, but really uh, uh, the stories is not told from their perspective, uh, their feelings, their judgments do not find uh, uh, space in those narratives. So uh, uh, I, again, I think this collaboration has made that possible, uh, uh, that at least we can present this story also from the perspective of the people we want to highlight. Great, wonderful. Well, that concludes our presentation part. Uh, so I know that there are already some questions in the Q&A, but I think we'll turn it back over to you, Ella, for um, the moderation. Well, thank you very much for a very fascinating presentation. We very much appreciate that. And your thoughts on the collaboration are very refreshing. So in African studies, that's what we want to see, like very intentional uh, from the very beginning that everybody is involved and, and participating. So I think uh, you give us a very uh, good uh, example there of, of collaboration. And we turn it now for the questions. So if you have questions, uh, you can type it in the Q&A section. Or you can raise your hand and we can uh, allow you to unmute and ask your question live. So those are possibilities. But I think you can go ahead. There are already some questions in a Q&A section. Yes. So I've had some time to look at those questions while my colleagues were talking. So I think I can answer the first one, which is, would you anticipate similar findings with Mount Everest and Nepalese communities of porters? Is there a lesson to learn in your research that may be relevant for other parts of the world? Um, and then the second question is about the environmental impact. Uh, would it be interesting to also research the impact of the climbing business on the condition environment of Mount Kilimanjaro? So I think Dr. Malubo has a lot to say on that. And then Dr. Mukunda, you can step in. I, I've been reading um, the literature on Sherpas uh, in the Himalaya and so I have some thoughts there. Some of them are preliminary as I, I still have some work to read. I've been reading mostly from those who um, are Sherpas or um, uh, who have yeah that personal experience. And I think um, in some ways the differences between the Himalayan uh, mountaineering and Kilimanjaro uh, are, are pretty important and there are also some really important similarities too. So I'll, I'll talk about the differences first. I mean, of course, there's there's a quite a difference between um, the kind of mountaineering that has to be done on, on, on both. So Kilimanjaro is open to so many more people. I would say it's actually more uh, hiking now rather than uh, mountaineering per se. Um, whereas, uh, I mean, you might hike in the snow at the top but there's, you don't have to have an ice pick. You don't have to have crampons most of the time. It's just really different. Um, and, and Everest, um, the most you know famous one is 10,000 feet higher. So that, that makes a big difference in the conditions. And so that meant that the first people to summit that we have uh, the 
evidence of is 1953 rather than 1889. So really different time periods as well. And it also means that the Sherpas have to have different skills. So these men who've worked on in the Himalaya um, are very skilled um, and um, to train others as well. And uh, with uh, a little bit of a higher profile, we have more written from the Sherpa's uh, perspective. So uh, Tenzing Norgay, who's the first one up with uh, Edmund uh, Hillary, uh, he had his, uh, he um, dictated his autobiography um, to someone and that was published. And then his grandson and his son have both written books as well that have been pretty important in that. Um, sense. And sim similarly, though, um, there have been, just like we found with uh, Kilimanjaro mountain crews, there are those who work just because it's they feel they have to. There's no other uh, better job or way for them to earn money. Whereas others actually really enjoy being on the mountain and uh, they want they are drawn to going there. So that's the same with Sherpas. You have the, the similar excitement. They're drawn to wanting to get to the top um, of Everest, um, but then others who feel like that's their only option. Um, of course, the support crew is absolutely crucial in both places, and um, we need to have more recognition, and Sherpas do want to have more recognition, and they want to have those. They don't want to be looked over in these accounts, and they don't want to be looked over when there's an opportunity to uh, reach um, the highest peak. So there have been I think Sherpas have uh, hold the the records for the most ascents uh, on Everest, and I mean these are they surpass many people. And staying up on Everest for over twenty hours, something like that, I mean they've really done a lot that we can um, uh, uh, commend them for. Um, and finally, the so so there are different things. The colonial aspect, I think, uh, has been highlighted in. In the Himalaya, um, I think that's a major, um, it's a similarity and a difference to the, the, the contribution of our work. Um, the 1996 disaster that John Krakauer wrote about in his book Into Thin Air uh, on Everest, uh, that was also instrumental in raising awareness in the international community about hoarders um, around the world, and that spurred on some of these uh, organizations and NGOs that Dr. Malubo talked about as well. So there is definitely some uh, influence um, in these discussions in different parts of the world. Do either of you want right. to uh, Yes, uh, yeah. the question on whether, will it be interesting to also reset the impacts of climb, climbing business on Mount, on the condition of environment on Mount Kilimanjaro? Yes, but it is good to appreciate that Mount Kilimanjaro has received quite a good number of research. Uh, there have been a lot of people writing on climate, on Mount Kilimanjaro, ecology on Mount Kilimanjaro, and the community that lives around Kilimanjaro, This, particularly the Chaga, whom uh, Professor Mkenda happened to speak quite well about. Uh, but there's been less, for sure, on the contemporary state of Kilimanjaro with regard to tourism. Uh, there are now about 50,000 uh, 50, uh, 50, tourists going to Kilimanjaro annually. That's quite a number. And uh, with all these supporting crew, the porters, the workers, I mean, the porters, the guides and cooks. So you, it's really a serious uh, uh, engagement with the mountain. And I possibly assume there could be quite a, a number of uh, uh, it, it could be an area for one to think about writing how that impacts the ecology of Mount Kilimanjaro. Uh, so yes, but I understand there's some being here and there studies with regard to tourism as well on Mount Kilimanjaro, they, but they may have not touched it quite well on uh, on um, the impacts of tourism on Mount Kilimanjaro. So it's possibly an, an area for one to think about, I, I suggest. 
I will probably just want to add a thought on the last question, um, uh, which uh, has already been answered so so well. Uh, and the, the, the addition that I, I just want to make is that actually, uh, it's obviously there's a, a significant impact uh, of the mountain that needs to be studied. I always tell people that I grew around Mount Kilimanjaro, um, and the, the 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 amount of snow I see on the mountain today is obviously not the amount of snow I used to see on the mountain as a kid. Um, and so these are matters that need to be studied well and explained. But finally, uh, uh, when the environment changes in in uh, in an attempt to respond to the challenge. The temptation of the Tanzanian government is usually to victimize the people, the local people around the tourism area. Um, and uh, we are already experiencing a similar challenge in Gorongoro, where the government's response uh, to environmental change is really to victimize the Maasai people who live in the Ngorongoro. And as I always uh, read and follow this case, I tell myself and I tell uh, other people that if the government of Tanzania succeeds in Ngorongoro, in what it intends to do basically to clear it of Maasai people, the next victims are going to be the Chaga around mm -hmm. Kilimanjaro. And so the, the, the environmental question is extremely interesting as we speak, and I highly appreciate that question. I, yeah, I, I wanted to confine myself within the discussion of quotas and all about Kilimanjaro, because if you mention Gorongoro, then you know what, how I belong to that place. So, and all the nasty stuff that are happening up there, I just, another book to make later on. So, it is, it is, it is, it's just awful, I possibly think, on how tourism has become not really of us, but of business and less of indigenous, just in a nutshell. I, there's so much that are happening over there, and it's actually this own people from the land, and uh, the business now become of others, not really of us, and yeah, so let me just confine and refrain from speaking much about because it would be a diversion of the topic that we have at hand. Yeah. So feel free to type your questions or raise your hand and be unmuted to speak. Uh, I was curious uh, to know what's the the local people like if they engage in the climbing, or is this just for 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 tourists? Like, do look are there some? I'm I'm thinking like rituals uh, around climbing uh, the the mountain that's specific maybe to locals that maybe tourists are just interested into getting up to the top. I was just wondering about that. What's the meaning? Otherwise, the meaning is, is yeah. there a difference in meaning and climbing from the local than the tourists? Have you noticed that? Or... All right. Wesley, do you want to, I can, no, can I go. say a little bit about that? Yes. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Ah, oh, I, I made some studies with regard to uh, this, the so-called protected areas in Tanzania and their closeness to people. And that is uh, how we have actually met these pro uh, protected areas less of us and more of them or of foreigners. Um, I think uh, with the Mount Kilimanjaro, for example, it becomes quite challenging for a local to take himself up to Mount Kilimanjaro. The procedures tend to be quite cumbersome and uh, expensive. 
One, for example, is required to, to go with an operator. Uh, these are the trekking business companies who will ask you for a commission for one to join, I mean, for them to give you a, 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 a you know, a support up to Mount Manjo. So one cannot just wake up morning from Rombo, from uh, Marangu, and take a walk up to Mount Manjaro without, you know, having all the papers together. And having that, for sure, is a challenge. And I, I tend to think this is now a case in many of the protected areas that there's less of us in and more of foreigners uh, experiencing and enjoying the protected areas that Tanzania happened to proudly host. Um, so there, yeah, there's less of uh, in, in, in in short. Thank you. And of course, they will always provide some reasons. They say, for example, one, if, for, if we permit each one of us to just go freely up without a company taking care of you, uh, the insurance related might not quite well on your side. So they will strongly say, with that, we are sorry. You have got to hire a company to give you a support necessary to. So I think even Kenda will be, who happened to grow up in Boshi and he calls Kilimanjaro home, uh, he doesn't have the luxury of climbing Kilimanjaro freely. Yeah. Uh, yeah, that's my view and my experience, of course. Thank you. That's very true. I think I think uh, uh, the mountain climbing around Kilimanjaro it has been so commercialized. It's, it's become really an expensive exercise. So uh, one or two uh, chaga young men or women cannot just decide that let's group up and climb the mountain. They, they absolutely cannot. They have to do a lot of paperwork on that. But uh, again, in line with this very interesting question, I just wanted to point out that, uh, again, when we look back into Chaga history, the question then becomes of how far up had the Chaga gone before Europeans started climbing the mountain? And we do have some clues that they have gone uh, significantly far, actually. Uh, so uh, there's at least uh, in Redman's experience, this is the first uh, uh, European missionary who saw the snow. Uh, he recalls in his journals that in his conversation in Machame, uh, uh, people told him that they had come down from the mountain. And when he, uh, he examined their feet, they had certainly been damaged by snow. And, and that seems to give a clue that at least some people had gone that far. Another clue that we have is that, of course, far up the mountain, not all the way up to the top, but to some significant distance, uh, there have been excavations of, 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 of pottery and other stuff that were most probably ritual, uh, giving an indication that probably uh, some Chaga people would go up uh, some distance up the mountain for ritual purposes, uh, mm -hmm. sacrifice and things like that. Uh, but uh, that's an interesting research as well, to be able to give a, a full explanation uh, to respond to that, that question. Thank you very much. And for you, Leslie, I was just wondering if you have stories of your students climbing, like what's the experience been, if, if there is anything that stand out? Yeah, for my, well, there are many things that uh, are involved in that. And, and Dr. Malubo has gone up with students as well. So with okay. the Mwenka students, uh, you know, one of the things that, it's it's of course one thing that draws people to these kind of experiences is pushing yourself to see if you can make it and it's not just about the mountain the first time i went with students i was so concerned i really i really wanted to make it to the top and i <laughs> so physically i was concerned about that and i was interested in uh, being there on the mountain 
Uh, and then when I got there, I realized it's also about the relationships. Uh, and when I started talking to the guide, so uh, I have a, a picture, maybe I can show it now actually, um, of my guides uh, who uh, we've actually gone with many times now. Um, and when, uh, so yeah, I'll just share this. When I first went, um, you'll see Joshua Mwakalinga, he is sort of right in the middle of the group there. Um, he's older, he started working in the 1990s. And, and actually he was, he's not from the Kilimanjaro region, he's from Mbeya. And it seems that he and a couple other people were the first ones to break into the Chaga monopoly on working on the mountain, which is another interesting story that we found. But he, he said, oh, I've, when he had gone up to the mountain 300 times, to the top 300 times, he stopped counting. And I said, oh, I need to, I need to interview this person for sure. So my very first time I was interviewing, and this I promise this will come back to the students as well. So I realized that uh, what, as he was talking and as the others uh, were telling me their stories, it, it, there's so much about how do you work with people on the mountain? How do you help people who are coming from different countries? How do you interact with them? What do you learn from them? And so for our students, uh, it's been a great experience, um, not only to have uh, the physical challenge and getting to know this new area of the world, the geography, but also getting to interact with the people on the mountain. Now, there are, of course, many different types of social relationships going on, the guides and the porters, and because of our connection with Dr. Malubo and uh, the, uh, Moika, um, and Fesso has also spoken to my students as well, then they have a different, I think, experience than most people do because they are a little more aware and in tune with some of the things. They try to talk to the porters more. I've had a student go and sit in the kitchen, I think, once, which is usually not what tourists do, but she wanted to go and, and interact with them more. Um, and so that's been a great experience for our students too, I think, who leave Tanzania uh, not just having done this adventure, but uh, having connected with people. Wonderful, thank you. Yeah, and yeah, just want to mention about the collaboration that we have as a College of Africa Wildlife Management with the rest of other uh, uni uh, universities or colleges. Uh, we we tend to host it. A student from BYU has been quite of us. Uh, they have a program joining Mweka every March, uh, no, every May uh, almost. Uh, and we also receive students from Manchester Metropolitan University and New York Oswego University have been bringing their students to have an African experience of protected area ecology, people, and tourism. So. Uh, we 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 are open to host all of us anywhere, you know, to learn of Africa, and we have all actually benefited quite strongly from uh, this kind of collaboration. So Mweka is quite open, and I can always be a door to uh, to Mweka. So our Karibu. Thank you very much. Yeah, <laughs> I would love to. I don't know if I'll go all the way to the top, but it, it sounds like <laughs> quite an experience. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> so we're almost out of time. If we don't have uh, questions and comments, I think we can uh, stop here. And once again, really thank you. It was a great talk. Uh, we, we appreciate you coming and sharing your research with us. If you have any final thoughts, please feel free to share it and then we, we can we can close for today. Well, I think maybe we'll use another Swahili term that people use a lot. Asante, Asante Sana. We're very grateful to have this opportunity. Um, I I will just say too, I my I have been enriched personally very much um, by doing this project and with the people who uh, I've spent time on the mountain with, but also with my colleagues here. It's been a, a real privilege and honor to work with such great people and scholars.
So thank you for giving us another opportunity to get together. It was our pleasure. I would also just want to thank you for this great opportunity. It's really been uh, great. And uh, thank you for the questions. Few, but very interesting. And as uh, I listened to the answers, as I looked at the questions, I realized that, yeah, we could do something there in the manuscript. We could adjust here and improve there. So, Thank you for your questions as well. And um, this has been a great experience uh, to have this forum to talk about our project. Thank you. Uh, yeah, another shukran. I think shukran is a, another word for Asante, Asante Sana, uh, for you know, hosting us and inviting us to speak about for the first time about our project. Uh, we're talking to the world. We hope. Uh, you are the, 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 the participant have taken some ideas from how the great this project has been. And uh, we think Leslie for the leadership, she has been quite a person to help us also navigate the entire project, uh, bringing up the financial support. She hosted us in, in the U.S. for the first time. Some of us came, went to the U.S. and this is the uh, part of this project, so we we are quite grateful for everything. I think quite, yeah, uh, Doctor Fen uh, Kenda, <laughs> you've been a father, and I think each one of us for all that we are doing to each other in making this project a success, and uh, hopefully by this year we'll have our book print out and be oh, shared and they be on the shelf of. Uh, uh, Kilimanjaro airports and the several other uh, libraries. Thank you. Thank you very much. And have a good afternoon or night for most of you. Night, night for me. <laughs> for I'm you. driving back home. Yeah. Well, well, wonderful. Thank you again for, for coming and sharing yeah. your, your research. And we look forward to the book.